Hey, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about functionalism. In the previous lecture, we talked about Titchener and structuralism, but today we're going to start a discussion about the forerunners or the precursors of functionalism. And we're going to put a spotlight on Charles Darwin. Now, as you will see in the lesson, Charles Darwin is not the only forerunner of functionalism. However, his contributions were significant. So let's take a look at the life of Charles Darwin and his contributions. So the way we want to conceptualize this is if we go back to our lecture on Wundt, and if we go back to our lecture on uh, Titchener, we said that they provided a solid base for other people to rebel against or protest against. So instead of looking at the structure of the mind, functionalists cared about how an organism adapted to its environment, and this becomes the, a uniquely American system of psychology. And remember that because a lot of the people that are part of the functionalist movement, uh, they went to Germany to learn under Wundt, but they tweak things. And the functionalist protest was a deliberate rebellion against the ideas of Wundt and Titchener. Now, not the people, but the, the systems that they offered. So if you were to sum up, what did Wundt and Titchener try and explain? They tried to explain the composition of the mind or what the mind is comprised of. Functionalists, on the other hand, are trying to figure out how to take psychology and apply it to the real world. And this is crucial at the, at the turn of uh, the, the century in the 1900s. So we will see that this rapid development of applied psychology was a product of the functionalist protest. So as I mentioned, there are several forerunners of functionalism. Charles Darwin, which we'll talk a lot about today, Fechner, which we talked about in lecture three, Galton, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, Wundt, which we talked about in lecture four, and some of the animal psychology experiments, which we discuss sprinkled into lecture three. Now, the most significant forerunners of functionalism are Darwin and Galton's work on uh, on comparative psychology or comparative research. It's important to note two things. One, Darwin and Galton are related. I think that was pretty cool. I believe it, uh, Galton is his cousin. And the other thing is that when we view functionalists as a protest against structuralism, don't interpret it as structuralism occurred first. The reality is functionalism was developing at the same time that Wundt's experimental psychology or volunteerism and Titchener's um, structuralism were forming. So, but let's talk about evolution, right? So if we think about evolution, theories of evolution are quite old. They go back thousands of years. So if we go back to ancient Greek philosophers, Anaximander came up with what we believe is the first theory of evolution. And he explains that there was a mixture of hot water and earth that uh, came together to create fish. And the first human actually grew in the fish until puberty, which was a source of protection. And then humans became uh, developed enough to live on their own. Uh, so they burst out of the fish. Uh, 
Now, this may seem primitive and unsupported by science, but nevertheless, we have to think about the time period and what Anaximander was trying to do. Anaximander was trying to figure out where did we come from? How did, how did this all come to be, right? So um, the idea that we evolved from fish and were living inside fish and the fish exploded and we burst out of fish, uh, it's an explanation. Uh, and at the time it was, it was fairly well received but that's our early theory of evolution. However, that's a philosophy, that's a speculation. Whereas Charles Darwin becomes a person who systematically studies evolution. And in the late 1800s, he's able to try and create a scientific case for evolution. So Darwin's Origin of Species became one of the most influential books in the world at that time and remains an influential book to this very day. Uh, and it was the basis of much of American psychology, right? This functionalistic uh, purpose, right? So the belief that if we evolve, we evolved in a way that helps us typically and promotes survival. So trying to understand uh, why we evolved the way we did, that is part of the American spirit and American psychology, right? So at its foundation, evolution assumes that living organisms can change with time. Now, even uh, Charles Darwin, was not um, the first one in his family to come up with the theory of evolution. Erasmus Darwin, which was the grandfather of Charles Dar Darwin and Galton, he suggested that all mammals evolved from a single strand that was made alive or uh, created a life force by God. Now, Charles Darwin deviates from this, right? Um, but nevertheless, I want you to know that the discussions of evolution are happening even before him. Now, other things, random facts about Erasmus Darwin. He was a physician, an MD, as you see. He was exceptionally overweight. And one of the things that he did, he had a, like a concern about this, was he would have his driver enter a home first to see if it could hold him. In terms of uh, passing on the lineage, uh, Darwin, Erasmus Darwin, that is, fathered 14 children from two wives and a maidservant and wrote erotic poetry. Now, we also have Lamarckian evolution. We don't agree with Lamarckian evolution, but nevertheless, uh, there is this discussion happening about evolution in, in the 1800s. And he felt that uh, an animal's body modified itself based on its needs. So uh, through, uh, for example, he used a draft. The giraffe needs a long neck to reach the leaves at the top. So he suggested that with great effort, the giraffe's neck became larger. And then that was inherited from generation to generation to generation. And um, ultimately, we don't adopt that theory. But if you've ever heard the theory that um, a giraffe's neck evolved, uh, to reach the top leaves, that's, uh, that's Lamarckian evolution. We also have evolution in terms of geology. So Charles Lyell discussed the concept of evolution of geology in earth. And he suggests that the earth went through several developmental transformations before it evolved to its current state. Now, 
there's a shift, right? That clearly happens, right? So if you look back to uh, the time of the Bible, well, we, there was a discussion of creationism, right? And uh, the discussion from the Bible and Noah's Ark was, you know, God created all these animals and fit them into the ark. And uh, Vespucci suggested, he asked the question, how could Noah fit all these animals in the ark? Because the dimensions of the ark were 300 cubits by 50 by 30, and a cubit is about two feet. So he was trying to understand how do you fit? Um, and the answer is, you know, from a biblical point of view, that that was one of the miracles, right? Uh, so why make the ark so large if it's going to be a miracle anyway? Uh, uh, Bible scholars suggest that we hide miracles within nature. So that's the answer. Uh, other people came to say, well, no, there are too many species. Couldn't have fit on uh, the ark. And we found new species since then. So it seems suspicious. That's the argument from many evolutionary um, uh, scientists. Now, in terms of chimpanzees and orangutans, they show human-like behavior. So we could teach them to eat with cutlery, understand communication, and recognize what was acceptable or unacceptable. We're doing this in the 18 hundreds, which is disturbing because if, if you can show that uh, chimpanzees and orangutans have human-like qualities, then uh, it's like, hey, wait a minute, All the only difference is education, right? So that was very disconcerting for people like Queen Victoria. Another set of information related to evolution is that the skeleton of gorillas and humans uh, are very, very similar. So uh, it is suggested that we have a common ancestor. So if we were to look, you know, fossils of extinct species have also been found. So we try and understand, well, hey, wait, that species no longer exists, for example, dinosaurs or whatnot. We might want to understand why they don't exist and uh, what that might inform us about humanity, right? So uh, the suggestion is that if we find fossils of species that don't exist, they didn't adapt and everything in life needs to adapt in order to survive. So if it doesn't adapt, it will go extinct. And the mindset or the, the mantra was change change was in the order of the day right so everything changes and uh you know in his time period i give you this context because there was discussions about evolution uh while darwin was even young so you're starting to see a shift in the the attitude or palette of society in thinking about these ideas, there's more willingness to embrace it, right? So we see social evolution uh, due to the industrial revolution. We see more intellect, intellectual curiosity. Uh, we see solid data and, um, and whatnot. So there is this movement. So all of that is the foundation of getting to Darwin. So let's talk about Darwin. Darwin uh, was a, a rebellious kid, pro probably describe him like Dennis the Menace. He enjoyed uh, playing pranks and get, uh, getting attention. And in his younger years, he showed very little academic promise. Now, that doesn't mean he wasn't intelligent. He just wasn't showing his academic promise. Now, he was interested in the natural sciences, 
uh, and made contributions to many of the natural sciences, uh, not just psychology. Uh, so biology, psychology, geology, all of these scientific disciplines want to claim him. So he was clearly interested and made contributions to all of these uh, sciences. Now, he gets into Cambridge and, you know, he was the typical college student, right? So if you were to think of a, a college student away from home, they're going to be partying, they're going to be drinking, they're going to be, you know, hanging out. So it is reported that he spent three years at Cambridge drinking, singing, and playing cards. So all of that, you would suggest that, hey, you know, maybe he isn't going to amount to anything. But his mentor finds a spot for him on a, um, a research team. So uh, in Britain, they were going to commission a ship to sail around the world and try and understand, you know, what was going on in different environments and not to mention, you know, try and see what Britain could do in terms of colonizing some of these places. But uh, they needed a, you know, um, a comparative person, someone who was um, a natural scientist or a naturalist. So Darwin's teacher convinced Captain Fitzroy to let him, you know, on the boat. Now, Captain Fitzroy was interviewing a lot of people for this position. And, you know, he came to Darwin, looked at him and saw his face, his appearance. And he appeared, you know, you know, a little bit more ignorant. He appeared lazy. So he's like, well, Darwin's not going to be a threat to the theory of, you know, creationism or this, the notion of creationism because Captain Fitzroy was very religious and he knew that whatever naturalist was sailing around the world, they're going to present their findings. So he strategically picked Darwin because he thought that he was no threat. So he spent five years sailing much of the world and um, Darwin took that opportunity to collect data. So you can imagine for five years, they're pulling in port and people on the ship are going and they're taking their liberties. They're hanging out with the locals. They might be swimming on the beach, but not Darwin. Darwin brought his jars and his sketchbook and he tried to collect various species uh, from island to island that he could fit in his jars. And if he couldn't fit them in his jars, he had a sketchbook that he drew uh, what the species looked like. So here's a sense of the captain, Captain Fitzroy and Her Majesty Beagle. Her Majesty Beagle uh, is the ship. Um, and so they sailed. Now, um, I will tell you, by the time Darwin gets back to England. He had a foundational theory on evolution. He was able to come up with a theory. Now, he wasn't yet ready to publish. And as we progress, I'll explain why. But I wanted you to know what happened. Um, in 1869, Darwin would get married and have 10 children. Contraception was not available the way it is today. Uh, Emma Wedgwood was his cousin. Uh, this was a time period where, and we're gonna hear from Galton, that people who were of prominence believed that they had to marry into prominence, otherwise it would somehow contaminate their gene pool. So marrying his cousin was a way of protecting the gene, so to speak. Now, Darwin had a lot of physical problems, likely an anxiety disorder, if you're, if you're thinking about it. Uh, based on his physical health, he frequently vomited, he had gas, boils, rashes, uh, depression, things like that. 
Um, and you'll see this. We talked about this with several major intellectuals that when they're on the precipice of becoming successful, they struggle, right? Uh, they struggle with their health and anxiety and mental health is not always uh, taken care of properly. So um, it is clear that Darwin struggled with um, anxiety. Now, ultimately he worked on his theory of evolution for 22 years before he presented it publicly. Now here's the deal. Originally his mindset was he wasn't gonna publish it until he passed away. And you might say, well, why would he hold off publishing such an important work? He knew that the, the Church of England would view him as a heretic and his life would be in you know, jeopardy, right? So uh, he had some fear that people would attack him or harm him. So he wanted to make sure that if he ever did present it, he had irrefutable evidence, that's number one. And two, if he published it posthumously, they can't kill you if you're already dead. Okay, so by 1842, he wrote a 35-page sketch. And by 1844, he expanded it into a 200-page essay, right? So uh, you could see that he spent a lot of time formulating his ideas and refining the ideas to a point uh, where it was clear to him. Now, so... Why did Darwin push his theory of evolution in the end? Well, there is this younger fellow by the name of Alfred Wallace. And Alfred Wallace uh, comes to Darwin. Now, by the time he comes to Darwin, you know, uh, Darwin's already considered an expert in uh, comparative research. And comparative is comparing animals to humans. So he, he was a noted scholar by this time. And Alfred Wallace comes to him and he says, hey, Darwin, can I ask you to take a look at my paper? I've been working on this theory for um, three days. You know, I, I want to know if I'm onto something. So when Darwin looked at his paper, he realized, hey, he's got a conflict of interest here, right? So what does Darwin do? Darwin tells Wallace, you have some good ideas here, but I'm biased because I have my own theory of evolution and I don't want uh, to be the person who dissuades you. So ultimately they agree to present their findings before the Linnean Society, which was, the scientific uh, society of the day. And Darwin presented his ideas and Alfred Wallace presented his ideas, but uh, Darwin wins the day. And you could think about it, right? If you're working on an idea for three days, no matter how good it is, you're not going to have the empirical data to support it. Darwin had been working on his idea for 22 years. So by the time he's presenting sections of his book, it's well fleshed out. So ultimately Darwin gets the nod and Darwin becomes known as the father of the theory of evolution. And Alfred Wallace becomes a footnote in history. So ultimately Darwin publishes The Origin of Species, right? And um, sold out right away, right away on the day it was published. And naturally, this comes with some controversy because he's suggesting another understanding for uh, the development of a species that doesn't involve creationism, right? So there's excitement for some and there's controversy for others. Now, you might say, well, that sucks. Alfred Wallace had this great idea 
and now Darwin's getting all the credit. And we have hyphenated in the past um, when there were multiple scholars who develop an idea, like Bell and Majan Day we talked about in lecture three. But that didn't happen here. So you might say, in the words of Richard Sherman, a football player, he once had asked his competitor, you mad, bro? Because they had lost the game. And if Wallace was asked this question, his answer was no. He was not bitter at all. He felt better the theory of evolution comes out in Darwin's name than not at all. And if he had inspired Darwin to finish his work in any way, he felt gratified in that. Now, I mentioned to you about Alfred Wallace. I skipped a um, honorific of his. Alfred Wallace becomes Sir Alfred Wallace, which means that the British monarchy knighted him. So he becomes uh, a major contributor to science in his own right, uh, despite the fact that he doesn't get the theme for the theory of evolution. Now, when Darwin publishes this book, has a whole host of uh, another bout with anxiety. And as a clinical psychologist, you see this, right? When a person has a mental health problem, they can get better and then they could regress. So in the DSM, we talk about recurrent types of disorders. So if you had a bout that resolved itself and it came back, this would be a recurrent subtype. And uh, sure enough, Darwin develops more fits of vomiting, rashes, boils, et cetera, lots of anxiety. Now, what was the premise of the um, book, The Origin of Species? Well, the, the premise is that if there was a mutation or some kind of spontaneous variability in a species, that mutation can be passed down, right? So, um, which is interesting because when we think about mutations, they can happen in one's life or they can be inherited, right? So you might say, well, what causes this adaptive property? The answer to that is natural selection. So um, every species is wired for survival. So we are trying to uh, adapt as much as possible and the characteristics that help us adapt and survive, we're gonna hold on to. The characteristics that are no longer useful or do not promote survival, we're gonna get rid of. So that basically is the, um, the foundation um, of survival of the fittest and natural selection, right? Because survival of the fittest only the most adapting or adaptable species is going to survive. And what determines which species survive or not? Nature, the environment, and your ability to adapt to your environment. So it's a fundamental idea, right? Um, that species have to adapt in order to survive. And if you don't adapt, that species will go extinct, it will not survive. Now, so um, if we were to think of what some inspiration is, we look at uh, Thomas Malthus, right? Thomas Malthus wrote um, a theory on the principle of population. And he suggested in the late 1700s that our food supply grows arithmetically but human population is growing geometrically. So there's gonna be a position where there are way too many people and not enough food. And uh, as a result of that, many people are going to live in a near starvation state. That was his premise. And only those creative, aggressive, intelligent and adaptable uh, people are going to survive. So if you look at 
the Malthusian dilemma, you can see the population in the, the dark black uh, growing much faster than the food supply. Now, we've had many generations since Malthus and uh, we've figured out how to uh, close the gap in terms of food supply. And one of the things that we've done is deforestation. Now I'll get to a problem with that in a minute, but deforestation allows us to take over other pieces of land and we could allow our livestock to live there so that we have meat to eat. We can plant on that land to grow greater product. And we have, you know, uh, also uh, additional uh, ways to increase plant production as well. So these things, we've resolved the Malthusian dilemma, but we've created another problem. When we remove these trees, the forests, all of these things, we are um, taking away from our larger ecosystem and many other species that live there are becoming endangered species, going extinct. And the carbon that is released, the trees absorb that, right? So they need that. So they used to absorb something like two thirds of all carbon emissions. But the less number of, or the fewer number of trees we have, uh, the greater the carbon emissions, and we're not able to keep up with it. So if you've ever heard an argument about global warming, that's part of the premise is that uh, because these carbon emissions remain, uh, the, the earth is warming and uh, the uh, polar caps are melting and it's going to create an existential crisis uh, in maybe not in our lifetime, but maybe in our children or grandchildren's lifetime. So we've created a, another dilemma in terms of our own survival. But that's not the, the point. Uh, we're talking about human, human evolution, but I guess in some ways, if we don't adapt to the current state, we will go extinct. We will die out as a, as a species. So. So maybe there is some connection there. All right, now, so Darwin generalized from Malthus observation to all living beings. And he, he used the concept um, or Malthus's suggestion about needing to adapt to develop his theory of natural selection. And he said, organisms that live to produce, reproduce they transmit to their offspring qualities that allowed them to survive, passing it through the genes, right? And failure to adapt results in failure to survive, right? So it's some of the same principles. Okay, so if we were to look uh, of offspring, we, we actually see that, um, many times the children have greater qualities than their parents, right? So the, the ability to adapt and pass that on, sometimes the children do have better, um, you know, better abilities to adapt. Uh, and over generation changes occur for, to promote survival. So if you think about in early 1900s, what life expectancy was, it was about um, 40, something like that. Now it's doubled to about 80. What do we understand that to be due to? Better healthcare, better nutrition, and some positive mutations, right? So there are all these answers as part of it. Now, obviously over generation changes have to occur. Now, Darwin accepted Lamarck's doctrine that changes due to experience in one's lifetime are inheritable. So that he did embrace that. So 
Huxley, um, he was a big proponent of Darwin's theory of evolution. He was a biologist and a, a one of England's uh, lead scholars. So uh, they organized a debate between Thomas Huxley and Bishop Wilberforce. Now Bishop Wilberforce was one of the lead clergy members of the day. And there was a debate on the theory of evolution at Oxford. And ultimately, Huxley wins the debate, right? And from that point forward, there was a sentiment that science was the enemy of religion. And that sentiment stayed to this very day. And we're pushing back a little bit now, but it, you know, when you think about Thomas Huxley debating a clergy member and out positioning him, you know, there's a lot of fear around that, right? And you have here, you have this bishop who's very renowned. So uh, Captain Fitzroy blamed himself for, uh, you know, even taking Darwin onto Her Majesty Beagle. And if Darwin never went on Her Majesty Beagle, then there would be no theory of evolution. And Thomas Huxley would not have disgraced Bishop Wilberforce, right? So there's this kind of guilt there. So he um, eventually commits suicide uh, about five years later uh, due to some of this guilt and pressure. So, you know, it was a different time period and the power of faith and religion was pretty strong, but he felt that he created this um, sacrilege. It was his fault. Right, so that was Fitzroy. Now, evolution, uh, typically people do view evolution as a, a threat to the Bible. And uh, many people view the theory of evolution as a challenge, right? And um, if you read the Bible literally, we have a problem because it says on day one, God created the heavens and the earth. On day two, God created blah, blah, blah. On day three, God created, and it lists all of God's creation day by day. And uh, a literal reading, this is saying, no, we have billions of years of, of evolution that happened between one species to the next, right? Now, uh, in 1930, 25, you have the Scopes trial or the monkey trial in which John Scopes was prosecuted for teaching the theory of evolution. In 1968, uh, we had the Supreme Court ban uh, teaching evolution, which ultimately it gets overturned. But uh, by um, 1990, even Texas allowed teaching of evolution despite the fact that one third of its uh, board members opposed it. So there's that piece, right? That, you know, that is a powerful, powerful threat. Now I will tell you that it's only if you take a literal reading of the Bible that the theory of evolution is any threat. If you understand that uh, time and space are not a constant, time expands through space. And you apply some physics principles and some other verses in a Bible that says a thousand years in God's eyes is a, as if it were a day, right? Uh, these concepts, both from physics and the Bible suggest that a day doesn't have to be a 24 hour clock. The only time a 24 hour clock occurs is when you have I guess on day six, when man sees sun up, sun down, sun up, and so forth, right? Uh, and seeing that clock. But before that, it doesn't have to be a literal 24 hours. And there was, uh, or there is a, a, an MIT physicist by the name of Gerald Schroeder, who wrote um, The Science of God and Genesis and the Big Bang. And in these 
uh, books, he creates an argument for a synthesis between the Bible and the theory of evolution. So it does not have to be that the theory of evolution is a threat. And to me, I teach the theory of evolution without any insecurity about the Bible, right? And I view myself as uh, a fairly religious person and my, my ideology is such, but that doesn't mean anything um, because science can coexist with religion. Now, we also had uh, this notion of white supremacy uh, and the white supremacy argument that evolves as whites were somehow superior to blacks. And um, this makes no sense, right? Uh, because how could that be if, if uh, both black people and white people evolved from a common ancestry, how could white people be inherently better? It makes no sense. And so even though this was an argument in that day, it, it really, even from a theory of evolution point of view, makes no sense. So Darwin and Huxley, they really get it. They become targets in the newspaper. They receive hate mail and death threats. And it was not very comfortable. So if we were to look at the progression, the evolution of man, you can see kind of this uh, proposed idea of how we went from, you know, uh, prehistoric man, Neanderthal to man, right? It's all there. Now, in addition to the origin of species, right? Uh, Darwin wrote uh, The Descent of Man because in The Origin of Species, uh, Darwin said little about human beings. So in The Descent of Man, he wanted to show similar properties or cognitive processes between animals and human beings. So from a Descent of Man, even our thoughts, our emotional processes all can be argued to be evolved or a product of evolution, right? So our descent of man is our cognition, an expression of the emotions in man and animals. So you suggest similar basic emotions, right? So if we were to look at uh, humans and animals and emotions, some of our body postures, some of our expressions suggest that we respond similar to non-human animals, such as um, gritting one's teeth to show aggression, right? You see that in canines and you see that in human beings. Uh, so from an emotion point of view, it's possible we acquired even emotions from our animal counterparts. And if we were to look at uh, emotions, there are, uh, uh, basic emotions that are considered universal. So if you were to think of the work of Paul Ekman, which is one of the early pioneers of emotions research, he, he said that there are universal emotions like happiness and sadness and anger. And we tend to see a smile for pleasure and a grimace for pain, right? So these are pretty universal. Not all emotions are universal, but there are uh, some tried and true that are universal. Now, this uh, m created curiosity about comparative psychology and animal psychology, trying to understand the connection between humans and non-human animals. Now, but Darwin didn't just talk about evolution. Uh, Darwin was interested in developmental psychology as well. So if you were to look at a biological sketch of an infant, he used careful observation to describe his son's motor development and how reflexes and motor responses occurred, right? And ultimately he waited till his son was 37 to publish this because, you know, just in case there was some kind of embarrassment, but nevertheless, a biological sketch of the of an infant is one of the earliest child psychology 
you know, works. Um, now, if we were to fast forward be beyond Darwin to some of uh, more contemporary research, uh, we talk about Peter and Rosemary Grant, who went to the Galapagos Islands in 1973, and they observed 13 different species of finch and various generations. And they tracked these finch for 20 years. And what they demonstrated was that evolution occurred much faster than Darwin expected. How so? They saw that the finch that uh, were in a climate that was dry and had severe drought, uh, well, they needed uh, larger beaks to break through that tough food supply, right? Because the, the food supply is going to be hardened, it's going to be large, it's going to be spiky, it's going to be very tough. So as, you know, as animals tried to open this, the, the animals that had the larger beaks survived and they passed on the larger beak to their children, right? The offspring, their beaks were on average four to 5% thicker than their uh, previous generation, which is pretty cool because you're starting to see this rapid evolution. Now, what about those species that were more rainforest area. So there's lots of rain and, and floods. Well, their food supply isn't gonna to be tough and large and, and dry. It's gonna be small, small seeds that are kind of, you need to navigate the wet soil to get at. So you need almost like needle nose pliers, these very, or these tweezer kind of beaks, very, very small pointy beaks to poke into the soil and dig out the seeds. So guess what? Uh, those finch that were in more of the rainy climate, the slender beaks were more of an advantage to survival and they were passed on to their uh, offspring. So we see that these finch were evolving based on the, the natural environment. So, and you get, you know, the pictures of what the different beaks were. Some had very big, thick beaks, some had more intermediate beaks, and some had very pointy uh, needle nose beaks. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Samuel Butler. Now, when we talk about evolution, we talked about people like Julian Delamitri who talked about machines and, and whatnot. So Samuel Butler applied the theory of evolution to machines. And he felt that um, even machines operated based on some kind of evolution. So if there was, um, I don't know, a computer chip that had a glitch, you had to replace it for a better one. If you think about your iPhone, there are updates, right? What's the update doing? It's trying to refine it, make it a little bit better so that your phone can work more efficiently based on the current status of technology. So there had to be some kind of evolution there. And if you tried to use a phone that was very old, it probably, you know, it would not work because the technology is so outdated that it's passed them by. So those uh, phone technologies, those computer chips become archaic and uh, they become replaced. Now, uh, mechanical intelligence, he suggested that machines could become self-regulating and self-acting. Uh, and to some degree, we have this. For example, if you think of a thermostat, it turns on and off the, the, com the compressor and the furnace to keep the room at a certain temperature. It's self-regulated. You don't need to keep turning it on and off. And in a more sophisticated sense, more recently we've been talking about AI and there's this major uh, controversy about open AI, right? And chat GPT, which are these um, 
artificial intelligence software, which people are, are allegedly misusing for a whole host of things. But there's controversy about where artificial intelligence is and whether or not we're going to create some kind of artificial human being through AI. Um, ultimately, I think we have nothing to worry about personally, but you know, who knows in 50 years whether I'll have egg on my face. Now, what did Butler predict? So Butler predicted that computers would eventually be capable of simulating human intelligence, which we see. Ultimately, machines would become superior to human beings, which we see, right? So if you think uh, about easy pass versus a toll collector, if we think about in factories that uh, fill bottles up and, and whatnot, they're far more um, efficient and effective than uh, human beings. But eventually, as a result of it, we would become dependent on these machines. So what happens if a computer crashes or there's a blackout? We may not be able to function properly. So that dependency. And we see some of that too. What happens when people um, are using their phone for GPS and their phone dies, right? There's a lot of anxiety. Oh no, how am I gonna get there? Well, it used to be that you read a map and you read a map and that's how you charted a course to get home. The idea of reading a map and planning um, a route to get home is a, a lost start because we've become dependent on things like GPS. Okay, so Butler wrote a novel called Erewhon or Over the Range, which is, you know, it's a play on, Erewhon is a play on the word nowhere. Right, so it's uh, flipped, uh, inverted, where you inverts the W and H, and it you could see that it's nowhere. So he pushes the concept of evolution of machines even further, where he suggests that eventually uh, society would be overrun by machines. Uh, a fear that I don't share, but nevertheless, this is you know one of his concerns. So what was Darwin's influence on psychology? Well, his general hypothesis was that there was a continuity in mental function between humans and non-human animals. And this becomes important for studying animal behavior and we could study animal behavior to give insight into humans. Most drug trials, even there we start with animal models because we understand that there is some connection across the species. Now, uh, the evolutionary theory in psychology suggests that um, a, an organism functions by adapting, right? And a nice thing about his approach was, whereas Wundt and Titchener relied on experimental processes, Darwin allowed for observational methods, right? His whole premise is based on careful observation as he traveled the world. So um, the support for the fact that you don't need to do a true experimental design is powerful, right? So Darwin influenced even research methods. Uh, and he put a focus on individual differences and testing right? The testing movement comes out of him and his cousin, Galton, which we'll hear about. So if I were to say, well, what are his two major contributions, boiling it down, comparative psychology and functionalism. So here is how Darwin viewed himself. Darwin, in his autobiography, uh, wrote all the, you know, he reflected on his success and he, he was like, um, there is a quote, it's amazing that someone of my intellect could influence really great men, something to that effect. He was baffled that his, his ideas were so widely received because he didn't view himself as very intelligent. He, did, he viewed himself as not very clever. 
He, his critical analyses and abstract thought were limited. His memory was a bit hazy, even though he had a pretty robust memory. Um, and the only um, redeeming qualities he had was that he was a careful observer, uh, a truth seeker, a collector of facts, and he loved the natural sciences. But if you look at the first few bullet points, he's like, I don't even know how I influence so many people. So what we see is, um, you know, he, he had a lot of motivation, right? And he, he had a lot of drive and he really, you know, he used his abilities uh, uh, to the best of his, uh, his capability, I should say. And um, when we think about it, what was it? He wanted to explain what he saw. He did not like starting from theory, so he distrusted deductive reasoning. He was more inductive reasoning. And um, as I said, I'm gonna skip a few bullet points, but he says with moderate abilities, surprising that I could influence the belief of scientific men, which was quite powerful. I'm gonna stop there, but if we're gonna pull back, well, what, what did we cover? We covered the antecedents of functionalism and did a deep dive on Darwin and his theory of evolution and the role of his theory of evolution on shaping functionalism and uh, so forth. We're going to continue our discussion uh, and we're gonna do a deep dive on Galton in next lecture. Until next time, take care everybody.